Ie. Dry in most areas tonight with just a few scattered showers, mainly near Atlantic coasts, but the odd one elsewhere. A cold night ahead with lows of minus three to plus one degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. I'm prepared to end it I can. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. So now we're gone in the FA Cup matches this evening. Still no goal between Leicester and Birmingham City. Manchester City 1-0 up courtesy of Sergio Aguero against Sheffield Wednesday. And Spurs with Troy Barrett on the bench this evening. 1-0 uh, up at home to Norwich City. 60 minutes gone in those games. Later on we'll talk to Dan McDonnell about a few different bits and pieces. First though, Dermot Corrigan joins us from Spain. Evening Dermot. Hey Joe, how's it going? Great. Been meaning to get to a Clásico for a few days now, so uh, this is the time. Real Madrid 2, Barcelona 0. Didn't get to see this game. Heard it wasn't great. No. Uh, yeah, the standard has dropped pretty badly from a couple of years ago. You know, when the Clásico came around, everybody all around the world. I guess even the fact that you, you didn't tune in is a, is a sign that it's lost a little bit of its its glamour, maybe. The, the standard has dropped. Some of the bigger players have left. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo's not there. Dani Alves, Javi Hernandez, these guys are gone from Barca. And the, a lot of the best players who have stayed are, are a lot older now, so um, getting into the 30s. So it was, it was a decent game, but it wasn't up there at that kind of amazing level that we were used to in Classicals maybe five or six years ago. Do you know, it's also it's just less available here. I would have had to mm -hmm. uh, find a method and it would have taken too much effort. And I, I, as you said, it's not the unmissable fixture that it once was, where it was just the best football being played in the world at that moment. So it's not that. Were Madrid deserving winners? Because the PK quote did the rounds in a big way. That was the headline quote from the game where he said, you know, effectively he couldn't remember as bad a Madrid performance as the other night and yet they won 2-0. So I couldn't quite make sense of what he meant. Yeah, well, afterwards Ramos said that he'd take it, you know, basically if if Madrid were that bad, imagine how bad Barca m must be if we could beat them. But yeah, the first half wasn't um, wasn't great on either side. Barca had the better chances, I guess, but it was played at a, a pretty kind of pedestrian pace and Barca were able to move the ball around. Madrid came out after half time much more intense, much more aggressive and really pinned Barca back and stopped them playing. Barca couldn't get out of their own half at times. It, took, it was difficult for Madrid to score. They kept getting the ball back and then maybe losing it again. Didn't have a a load of chances but then in the end they got the goal a bit of a deflection off PK into that off Vinicius and Barca you know didn't have a shot on target after Madrid went ahead so Madrid were, were not at their the kind of high level that you would expect maybe but they were deserving winners for sure. Is the uh, drop in quality being called out and being talked about in Spain or is the fact that you have a very vibrant title race there's just one point in it now Madrid 56 points Barcelona 55 is that some kind of solace? Is that more of the talking point than almost uh, a certain navel gazing and wondering where the league is? Yeah, there, there's two kind of schools of thought on that. Like Jorge Valdano, who's ex Madrid um, player, coach, sporting director, he was on the radio pre previewing the Clasico and said it was like two. It's hard to exactly translate it without it's kind of a, a weird word to translate, but it's kind of like two teams who are hobbling towards the line or two guys who are injured, not at their best, older guys who, who are kind of past their peak. Um, so he was saying that the, the general standard of Madrid and Barca had dropped. I was at an event with the Liga president Javier Tebas and he was saying how great it was that La Liga, that the, the standard had risen, that it, you know smaller clubs like Levante or Mallorca or Granada were able to beat Madrid and Barca, that he was pointing to the Premier League where the winners now get 100 points and that is being an uncompetitive league, whereas Spain has more excitement. You know That, that kind of cliche that in, any team could beat any team is now more relevant in, in Spain than England. There's a bit of both to it. Like, Madrid and Barca, just for a couple of years, just had the best players in the world. You know, th mm. that Spain team, which was built around the Barca players, and then they had Messi, and then Madrid spent so much money to get Ronaldo and Javi Alonso and these guys. So that was, it's maybe impractical to, to imagine that any just two teams could, could be so good again. But yeah, people are not as, even around the stadium before the game, talking to some of the other journalists, talking to the Madrid fans, there wasn't as big a, a hype around the game where they weren't looking forward to it as much as maybe three or four years ago when you had... Messi against Ronaldo and, and Pep against Mourinho. I've heard it said that although Messi's statistics and his output on paper look uh, as healthy as ever, or certainly very, very healthy, that there are, are less uh, perceptible signs that his form 
is in decline, whether that's terminal decline and this is the beginnings of the end for Messi, I don't know. What are you seeing from him on the pitch? How is he playing and what is the word on his form? Well, he, he definitely has a, he plays a different role. He, he's kind of taken over from, from Xavi and Iniesta as the guy who puts Barca's moves together. So he, he comes back, pl plays a lot of his football around the centre circle, playing one-twos, kind of trying to open up space in the defence. And then, you know, maybe five or six times a game, he'll burst into action and he'll he'll come forward, he'll play a one-two, he'll, he'll beat a couple of players and knock it in the net. Um, at the very highest level, it's more difficult for him to do that. You know, there was a time maybe when he was able to do that against anybody. Now he's, his stats maybe are padded, Pat, it's a harsh word, but you know he scored four times against Ibar at the Cap now a couple of weeks ago. Some really good goals, skip past players, put it through people's legs, and uh, and score the goals. But he hasn't scored away from home in La Liga since December, I think. And mm. um, didn't look like it at, at the weekend. It was he was true in the first half, and Courtois saved well in the second half. He was true, and you couldn't believe it. Marcelo got back to you know everybody in the stadium was like, oh crap. Um, Messi's, Messi's through, what are we going to do? Mm. And then there was that kind of realisation that he's not actually going to be able to, to carry the ball the whole half half of the pitch. And Marcelo got back and even when Marcelo tackled him, there was a huge roar. It was like they'd scored a goal. It was like we've been able to get it off Messi. Yeah. Whereas a couple of years ago, he would have just been away, smacked it in the top corner, got the ball back at the net and, and gone and done it again. But it's more difficult for him now. He's playing in a team that's not as good and he has to do more work outside the box. So it, it's hard to blame it on him. But yeah, he's... He, he's not the player he was or he's not having the impact that he was. Yeah, it was bound to happen at some stage. Uh, Barcelona is a, a tempestuous political club at the best of mm -hmm. times. So uh, Messi may be on the wane to some extent or other, but still clearly uh, the alpha male uh, in, in the playing group at least and beyond. And you have a new coach in Kike Setian and you have the Eric Abidal versus Messi war. Abidal blamed the players for getting the previous manager sacked. And I'm sure there must be a political uh, election I, uh, upcoming because it always feels like there is one at some stage so is this a club that's even more in strife than it can so often be yeah it's, it's going to be super interesting to see how, how it works out even since the game at the weekend um, the, the Spanish TV picked up um, Saravia is is Kike Sedian's number two very a uh, very strong number two has a big role in especially the coaching the players and putting together the plans for, for the games and he was on the bench criticising the players you could didn't do that thing where they cover their mouth that, that they're supposed to do so that the cameras were able to pick it up that he had a go at PK and he had a go at De Jong and Arturo Vidal and different players and that hasn't gone down well at all there's the kind of you know the dressing room sources saying that Sadien and his team wondering whether they're really up for for the job whether oh, it's it's too that, much for that them quick yeah the, the the same stories kind of point out that it they don't really blame them for being in the situation that is the the president's fault or the sporting director's fault for hiring somebody who wasn't really up for it because they had gone ahead and fired Valverde without having a, a plan B so again well, how long said he last you know if Barca don't win La Liga and if they go out of the, the Champions League then maybe there will be a big shake up in the summer there could be presidential elections even within the board there's a couple of maybe people who who might run for the job, who have moved themselves slightly away from President Bartomeu, you know, didn't, decided against going on the trip to Napoli last week, let it be known that they weren't happy with some of the decisions that were made. That type of, of kind of political manoeuvring is going on. So, yeah, it's up to the, the team. Pique said a couple of weeks ago or last week that the, the team's performances had held the club together, whereas it wasn't that the the president or the managers even, it was that the players have been the ones who were, mm. who were holding in what could be a, a crisis, I guess, at, at Barca. And if the players aren't able to do that anymore, if, you know, PK and Messi, these guys are, are just coming to the end, mm. then that can all explode. Yeah, and, and Messi's ending is a difficult thing to handle when it does come. Uh, he needs to be okay with the ending as well, or things could get uh, very messy, but that's for another day. As for uh, Madrid, uh, we would have seen the Man City game here, obviously. Everyone would have seen that game. Uh, really enjoyable and they're 2 one down against Manchester City. They continue to, you know, defensively keep things together and the win against Barcelona, obviously, a, a good thing. I'm seeing uh, reports that Pochettino is, uh, his name is circling and being mentioned. That might be real, it might not be real. Is Zidane standing at the moment? Because I was, I was quite, kind of quite surprised a couple of weeks ago when we talked and you said he was... Uh, it was it was accepted by everyone, maybe because of his legendary status, amongst other things, that uh, good defence and relatively unexciting football, but you know, churning out results was going down okay with Madrid fans. Uh, now that they're behind against Man City, 
is, is, is Zidane's place at the club still as safe? Is he a man under pressure? Are they bemoaning the style or are they still happy enough to, you know, chug out these results in, Le in La Liga and hopefully beat Man City? Like losing to, to City and losing to Guardiola and the way that the game went where it was seen that, that Guardiola had, had outthought Zidane or his substitutions had changed the game, whereas Zidane had blown a 1-0 lead, which is a harsh way of looking at it, but yeah. that was how it was read by, by some people here. So going into the weekend, he looked to be under a bit of a cloud because they got knocked out of the Copa del Rey at home. They dropped points in La Liga, Barca taken over at top of La Liga, and they were looking out of the Champions League. So it didn't look so... so so rosy for him, and if they had a lost against Barca, he, you know, the pressure would have mounted. Beating Barca and beating in the way that they did, which was Zidane ball, I mean, kind of phrase there, but you know, they they didn't play great football. It was all about the intensity. It was about the, the pressing, being able to overpower mm. Barcelona more, more than outplay them. It worked. It beat Barcelona, and you know, now it looks like it, they're they're her favourites again to win the La Liga title. People do accept, I guess, that City are very good. That Guardiola is very good. Accepting defeat is not something that happens very often at Madrid, but if they were to, to win the Liga title and put up a decent show at, at City, I'd be surprised if anything happened to Zidane. Um, okay. But again, it's Madrid, so we are surprised sometimes. Oh, it's completely off the wall. Like I mean, I, I even feel ridiculous asking these questions from week to week, but that's how quickly it seems to change over there. Mm -hmm. And I did see the Pochettino name being bandied about. Is his name bandied about quite a bit? Like, is, is he perceived over there the same way he is closer to this side of the world which is the next Real Madrid manager at some stage or other yeah he, even um when, when he was here as Espanol coach or was in in Barcelona as the Espanol coach um he impressed people in Madrid especially at the upper levels of Madrid how he a little bit in how he took on Barcelona how he took on Guardiola he, with his character the way that his team has played and he's always been very excuse me, very polite about Madrid in media interviews. He's kept the, the channels of communication open with the club. And he's seen as somebody who would have the, the stature or the status to to be a, a future Madrid manager at, at some stage down the line. Um, I guess maybe it depends how what other opportunities open up for him. But the way that he, the work he did at Spurs was very highly rated here. And just his his personality and his views on, on the game and maybe his, just a little bit of anti-Barcelona kind of edge that he has all, all help when he when the people at Madrid are thinking about who they might hire next. Okay. Dermot, thanks, Mill. Much appreciated. Cool. Cheers, Joe. Dermot Corrigan there with the latest uh, in Spain on El Clasico. Madrid beating Barcelona 2-0. So they're one point clear in the La Liga race, 12 games to go. Uh, but a general sense that the other teams are more likely to take points off uh, both Madrid and Barcelona than in previous years. So it's still relatively open. Latest in the FA Cup, still 1-0 Spurs against Norwich. Still 1-0 Manchester City away to Sheffield Wednesday and still nil all Leicester City Birmingham. A short ad break, we're back with Dan McDonnell. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen. News Talk Breakfast. Rock music as a form of protest, as a, as a way of offending the establishment of the older generation, that day is gone. You and Bob Gellup, you're two old men raging against well, the dying that, of the yeah. light. When, when was the last time but you like, were offended by mainstream rock music or by something it did or by a lyric or whatever? Mark, I'm a young man. I'm not the one who's offended. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. I forgot. You know, a Taylor Swift one, fan. I mean, look. Rock and roll is dead. But look, they've got good riddance to it. The king is dead. Long live the new king. That king is Drake. News Talk Breakfast. In association with AIR. Weekday mornings at 7 on News Talk. Have a great evening with itsforwomen.ie. Don't live your life on hold. Get a quote now at itsforwomen.ie and see why we're trusted by over 130,000 women in Ireland. In Thursday's Irish Independent, don't miss exam brief in partnership with Yates College, your essential leave insert exam guide. Each subject will be explored in depth with advice and study techniques, exam answer strategy and timings. This week we explore leaving cert geography, history and tum economics with unmissable tips on how to stay ahead of the curve. Only inside Thursday's Irish Independent. At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Like Black Knight, the number one Irish web host. From small beginnings in 2003, today Black Knight hosts more Irish websites than anyone else, offering email, domains and a range of business services. Operating locally and trading internationally, the Black Knight team in Carlo supports 84,000 customers in 130 countries. Guaranteed Irish welcomes companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. Guaranteedirish.ie. Altogether 
weather better. We've done it again. At KBC, we've dropped some of our fixed rate mortgages. Again. And with lower rates come lower monthly repayments. So why not talk to us about a KBC mortgage today? KBC, the bank of you. Information correct is 2nd of March 2020. See for verification. Rates available to residential mortgages only. Lending criteria, underwriting, terms and conditions apply. Security and insurance required. KBC Bank Ireland PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Warning, if you do not keep up your repayments, you may lose your home. Warning, you may have to pay charges if you pay off a fixed rate loan early. Whether mending fences in Donegal or on a building site in Cork, there are thousands of hard-working Ford commercial vehicles in Ireland. It's why we're truly the backbone of business. And now we'll give you an additional €500 Euro off the recommended retail price. If you purchase a commercial vehicle during our backbone of business dealer event from the 1st to the 31st of March, that will really get your business moving. Ford commercial vehicles. The backbone of business. Search Ford Backbone Event or visit Ford.ie to discover our full range of offers. At participating dealers, exclusions apply. The purchase of sex is illegal in Ireland. That means that if you're caught, you'll be arrested and may have to appear in court and explain it to your wife and children. But maybe they'll believe you only wanted the girlfriend experience or that you really thought the woman was there by choice or that you think that prostitution is just a job like any other. But I wouldn't count on it. The vast majority of men don't buy sex and don't buy the excuses of those who do. Prostitution. We don't buy it. Go to wedontbuyit.eu to learn more. The average toilet seat contains about 49 germs per square inch. The average office phone and keyboard, over 25,000. Protect your staff against viruses and germs. Get your office and IT equipment professionally cleaned and sanitized by Alpha CC. For a free consultation, call Alpha CC on 286 1800 or visit alphacc.ie. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Adam Ida's come off the bench for Norwich. They are 1 0 down away to Spurs. Troy Parrott, meanwhile, is sitting on the Spurs bench uh, watching Adam Ida kicking his heels. And uh, I don't know, we'll see how many minutes he gets. But they're 1 0 up, Spurs. And in the other game, Manchester City 1 0 up as well away to Sheffield Wednesday. Still no goals between Leicester and Birmingham. 15 minutes to go. Uh, one shot on target apiece in that game. So it doesn't sound like it's a thriller just yet. In the meantime, before we uh, update you on full times in those games, Dan McDonald was in studio earlier on. I first uh, put it to him that Stephen Kenny, given that he has Bulgaria ranked 58th in the world, first in the Nations League, followed by Finland ranked 59th in the world, second, and then a home game against Wales, then another game against Finland, and they don't have to face Wales away until well into the campaign, that it's not the worst way for Stephen Kenny to have to begin his tenure? No, I think so. I mean, I did a piece in the end though beforehand that I think I I had like, you know, the, the best draw scenario and I had Finland and Bulgaria in it. I just didn't have Wales. I think Wales is actually one of the tougher top seeds. I think uh, might like the Czech Republic there. But yeah, you, you can't really complain with the options that he's got. It's a, you know, a way to Bulgaria who definitely probably aren't the nation, the force that they once were. I know you, you spoke about that a bit last night and a couple of home games in Dublin, you know, weekend games in Dublin, so, uh, which I think for even for supporters matters. So, it's yeah, it's nicely structured. I mean, there's not much more you can say really at this point. I mean, it's there's so much happening in the next month and, and hopefully in the summer uh, that these games are an after, you know, for now they're down the news agenda, but come the autumn, I think, I think, yeah, I wouldn't, maybe wouldn't be as enthusiastic as Mick McCarthy was in the FAI release saying, yeah, they should win the, well, he didn't, he didn't say it in the FAI, but he definitely was as good a draw as we could have got. I'm not sure, that, I think that was more Mick, as he said, I think he said it last night, in pundit mode, as opposed to, if Mick was the manager, I don't think he'd be saying, well, of course, this is the group we're going to, uh, I mean, this is a group that we can win, which I think he did say. Tell you, um, I, I tell you what, if I didn't win that group now, I'd, I deserve to be sacked. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a, no excuses, Stephen, vibe to the whole thing, you know, so. It is so hard to predict where we'll be as a, a footballing country because this may or may not be Stephen Kenny's first game after the Euros, or we may have had two to three Stephen mm. Kenny friendlies in June and we're eager for competitive football. So, again, that's why it's so hard to know yeah. Yeah. what shape Ireland will be going into these games. Very much so. Um, what we do know, I guess the one thing compared to last time, I'm not going to go Kevin Coban style permutations here, but we do know in simple terms that these games do matter. Like that's as simple as that when these games come round, yes, it's important to experiment and it's important to, you know, integrate young players, but the results are also important too. Like 
the way it's structured, it's only important if you really win the group. You know, that's the, the big thing. If it looks like you're not going to win the group, you can maybe mess around a bit in the last game or two without any, you know, massive cost once you're not going to finish bottom. You know what I mean? So it's sort of, if they get a, if they get a win or two early on, it sort of means you can have a shot for glory or use it to experiment. So it's a good opportunity. Uh, speaking of Mick, he was at the game on Friday night at uh, Tallis Stadium. He was impressed with Jack Byrne, missed Jack Byrne's goal, saw it on his phone afterwards as Friend we Friend of Kate Middleton, Jack Byrne. I was just going to say, it's been quite the week for young Jack. Uh, I mean, uh, all we can hope for in life is for someone to look at us the way Jack Byrne looks at Kate Middleton. It's extraordinary. And a sentence that I didn't expect, or a situation I didn't expect to be uh, yeah. contemplating this week. Because when I first true. saw the photo at the, at the Guinness Storehouse last night, I saw uh, Jacob Stockdale first. He just caught my eyes, the taller man, talking to Kate Middleton. She was talking to him. And Jack Byrne was alongside them, staring at Kate. Is that who it was in the picture? That's who it looked like to me. I thought it was Guy Ringrose, no? Oh, I thought it was Stockdale. Was now, it Ringrose? Now, I must admit, I had no idea who it was, right? Mm. And I sent the email to several people. Now, Joe Malloy, face of Virgin Media's TV, you know, rugby coverage, I would expect that you, you could be right here. I thought it was Ringrose in the no, photograph. No, no, no. I mean, the lingering image is Jack Byrne's face. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, mean, like, I, I quickly moved <laughs> off the rugby player. Like, well, Jack is sort of, um, you know, you speak to anyone who's been in a dressing room with Jack. Like, Jack's pretty full-on, lively character, centre of it. But it looked like he might have been silenced somewhat, you know? It looked like he might have necessarily been the... The oh, I've had another look. It is Ringrose. Yeah, there it you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. But I mean, but I mean, you're annoyed like, over this now, Joe, aren't you? Ringrose is irrelevant in this picture. There's only two people in this picture. It's Jack and Kate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only two players in this game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I was Prince William, I would have been looking at that and saying, I need to get back over here. <laughs> There's something going on I'm over not, here. I'm not letting this develop. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was uh, great, but uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's something that uh, you know Mick can discuss with Jack if he is in the. Uh, in the squad. If the you have uh, no idea what we're talking about, then important uh, distinction. Yeah, yeah, Prince William and Kate obviously doing the rounds. Guinness Storehouse last night. The British ambassador held a, 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 a kind of um, a get together, including, as we can see now, Gary Ringrose and, more importantly, Jack Byrne, alongside the uh, future king and queen. And uh, the photo emerged of Jack deep in conversation. Although I'm not sure Kate Middleton was deep in conversation with Jack, but he was. He was saying something, saying something to her. To oh, no, her. He, they've spoken about, I think he spoke with Prince William about Jack Grealish and stuff because he's okay. a Villa oh, fan. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack would be mates with Jack Grealish, so. At Jack B underscore eight, and Jack himself has tweeted some pictures of it, so. Uh, huge huge honour, he said, yeah. Look, good on him, uh, and he's had a good week. But um, I did want to, that game in particular, and we didn't touch on it too much on Monday night's football show or even last night's football show, we did discuss it on the paper review, but I mean, as advertisements for the future potential of the league, it was about as good as it gets. I mean, if we can get to that kind of a place, even in, you don't want to say 10 years, everything's possible, but even if in 15, 20 years, that became more the norm, yeah. we'd be in a great place. Oh, listen, it was, it was terrific. Like, it is the two best teams, and, you know, you need to have that depth throughout the league, yeah. which, which we most certainly do not at the moment. Um, but I think, you know, if you have your two best teams, Playing, you know, an open brand of the game, rather brand of football, rather trying to trying to cancel each other out in some ways, which can happen, of course, when two good teams meet. Um, but it was actually about sort of attacking players, trying to express themselves. They were given the freedom to do that. You had good skill. I mean, amazing skill. But Flores, bloody hell. But also, just in the general quality of the game was quite good. And even you know, even at Dundalk at three two down, nearly got an equaliser. It was a great defensive header by Lopez at the end. Um, but like moments to talk about. I think I've made this point a few times that people want, like people go to a game. If you go to a league round game on a Friday night, people ultimately want to come away with something to see people do stuff that the normal person can't do. You know, and even that just that Flores goal or even the Jack Byrne goal is like, yeah, this is these are good now. I mean, they, of course, anyone who is playing at that level is a good player, but they don't always like showcase it. They don't always get the stage to do it. They don't always have the pitch, you know, the, that allows them to do it, or the backdrop that allows people to concentrate on the the football rather than maybe get distracted by just the inadequate facilities or whatever it might be. So, yeah, that's a template. I think if you're if you're Niall Quinn or if you're Gary Owens or if you're whoever is tasked now with, you know, with taking the league forward, I mean, you're, you're taking that game 
and you're packaging that and and you're 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 using that as your this is this is what can be done but there's a lot there's a lot in that and you know stadiums and and uh you know even the the the, the tv package and how you are able to actually you know like a couple of years back you would have had to wait if that game hadn't been on tv you might have to wait three days to see to see that goal yeah. the flores goal which is just when you think about it, it like for the time we live in now is absurd but that's where we were very recently so um yeah, and like I, at least, I mean, I always say you can't. As much as I would love if League of Ireland was more popular on a widespread basis, I've just gone way beyond the point of saying that you can't just preach to people and and say to them they should go and watch it. As much as I feel, I find it, you know, maddening sometimes that people don't want to go and watch football in the locality because to me it's normal to just go and watch football where you live. But that's just me. And you can't just, you know, guilt people into doing it uh, as though it's a form of, like, martyrdom that they have to... Like, they have to be entertained. There needs to be a good product. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the next time the Dawkins and Shamrock Rovers play, you know, the next couple of times they play, that shouldn't take much selling. You know, that, and, and that's a worthy occasion. And, and you know, it, 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 it's like, actually take this seriously as a, as a sporting entity. And I hope that that's, that's what happens when it comes around. We had Raphael Honigstein on last night. He was talking about the very interesting situation at the weekend when Hoffenheim played Bayern Munich and he was talking to us about the general backdrop to that controversy. So in the Bundesliga, I think, as most people are aware, there is the 50 plus one rule whereby in the vast, vast majority of cases, the clubs are owned by 50%, 50 of the, the fans own 50% of the club plus one share. So they always have a controlling uh, vote when it comes to important matters, mm. uh, the running of the club, they're run for the fans, everything from ticket prices to general finances and, and beyond. And ultimately it's to stop things like oligarchs coming in and making the league incredibly uncompetitive by ploughing money in, pre-financial fair play rules I'm sure, or even just leverage buyouts like the Glazers, all those kind of things. And it seems like a, a the pre preferable model to most people, few exceptions like Hoffenheim, by Leverkusen and Leipzig. But yeah. I did want to ask you on the back of that conversation, what is the prevailing ownership model in the League of Ireland? I know the Dundalk purchase was high profile. So I know a, a group came in and bought Dundalk, but what is the prevailing ownership model in the League of Ireland? Yeah, it's a mixed bag. Like Dundalk, you have a private investment firm from America who, you know, who, who own most of the club, but there's actually also individual American other sort of businessmen who hold shares and stakes and they're all part of the board. That's a very different one. Um, not dissimilar to what we've had in the league in the past where a lot of clubs are really, you know, privately owned. Like, like there's, there's a contrast around the league. You have a club like St. Patrick's Athletic where Garrett Kelleher basically is a benefactor that has propped that club up and, and pumped money into the club over, what, 13 years now. He's, he's been the main he's been the main man there. Waterford is similar with Lee Power come in and, and you know, you have clubs who are very much reliant on these people that if if they for somehow reach a point and sometimes it's like people are for years oh, well, Keller is going to leave and he's still there 13 years later so he's earned the benefit of the doubt at this point but you are vulnerable to these private ownership that if they decide to leave for whatever reason uh, you're in trouble and that's been the, the case in the past with a lot of the boom and bust. Uh, we have had a move towards like fan owned or member owned clubs like Bohemians would be a member owned club at the moment um, wouldn't have like a big benefactor um, you know, which is pumping in his own cash or, or our cash, which is a problem for them in terms of you know keeping up with the the top two because they're reliant on commercial revenue and gates and other stuff and, and stuff that's very variable. Um, Cork City were the this is the most interesting case at the moment. The Cork City were the the shining example of a fan run club. Um, 100% owned by the supporters who, who, who saved the club after a succession of bad private owners, basically. And uh, the, the club was dead 10 years ago. You know, called Forest, uh, that's the name of the, the fans group that basically started from nothing, bag of jersey territory, and they got Turner's Cross back and stuff, but they started from nothing. And over 10 years, built, you know, they, we got to a situation where Cork have had a great decade, overshadowed by Dundalk in terms of, you know, a great, great team came along, but they pushed them all the way and they won a double, um, but yet they've ended up broke at the end of it. And this is the slight problem that they've, they've, they've hit, that they, before the start of the season, they had a crisis meeting, which basically led to Trevor Hemmings, the owner of Preston, coming in um, and basically paying money for the buyout clauses that they'd negotiated for Shawnee Maguire and Alan Brown. Uh, doing a deal which helped the club get their licence and Cork are now in this uh, debate, this dilemma between the fans that they're thinking um, 
can we actually, as a fan-run club, compete, or do we need to open ourselves up to Trevor Hemmings, who now wants to take over the club effectively? And this is the problem that in Germany, and, and it's a population thing to a degree. I mean, you have clubs who have thousands upon thousands of supporters, so their contribution they can create, you know, generate a bigger amount. I think in a smaller league, when you're trying to compete with um, powerful entities that have, a, you know, financial power to just throw money at it to a degree. Uh, it's harder for the fan-run club and Cork say they struggle to maybe get the commercial support down there they would have liked which has to go with it you can't just function as a fan-owned club but people pay an X amount a year without massive sponsorship and stuff to go with it but I will go back so this is why Shamrock Rovers are the interesting one because they're probably the closest to the German model you mentioned it's it's 50% fans and 50% private effectively and Ray Wilson a very wealthy Shamrock Rovers fan based in Australia um, you know, his standing grew three years ago from being a, like the fan run club and it's Way Wilson and that. And then over the winter, just gone, Ray Wilson, who had 50%, sold half of that. So now 25% is, is held by Dermot Desmond, who paid, I think, three million quid, two, three million quid to come in and take 25%. And that's like a considerable businessman investor to come into the equation. So the fans still had to vote to accept that. They still had to have a decision to whether they would welcome Dermot Desmond's investment. They decided to do that, but they've got the best of both worlds. They have the involvement of the supporters who still have a say in decision-making. So in theory, if there was a, a rogue situation, they, they have a degree of control to stop that, but they also also have the support of wealthy people on the other side. And I think you know Cork and, and other clubs, you know, Galway are fan owned, but you know, they need yeah. the, the Comer Brothers. Like you need a bit of both. And I think that that's in a smaller league, realistically you do. Um we've had massive historical problems with, you know, bad owners in the league, you know, who've who've left clubs high and dry. Um but you're trying to find the best of both worlds in a small league. It's it's interesting debate, you know. And I, I know there's stuff on the website here about AFC Wimbledon and what they did, and um, you know, there's I definitely think different leagues need different things um, in this regard. And the the history of fan ownership here is it's it's mixed. I'd have to say it's it's a positive thing generally, but there comes a point where clubs probably are always going to need a, a small bit of a you know a, a big guy with them to help them out. That is the voice of Dan McDonald. More from Dan in a few moments' time. I uh, should let you know we're pretty much into the final seconds of all the FA Cup games this evening. Leicester have got that goal against Birmingham City, so 1-0 up with seconds remaining. Manchester City, similar story, 1-0 up away to Sheffield Wednesday, seconds remaining. And uh, Spurs pegged back by Norwich City. They were 1-0 up. And uh, Dormich, Drimmich with the goal on the 78 minutes for Norwich has them one all with seconds running there. So that should go to extra time. Troy Parrott on the bench. Adam Ida came on for Norwich in that game. Back in one second. Off the ball on News Talk. At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Like LIA, a professional association that's been supporting and developing those working in financial services in Ireland for over 40 years. Offering a wide range of education services, including the QFA course, LIA serves a membership community of over 14,000 financial service professionals. Take your career to the next level at LIA.ie. Guaranteed Irish welcomes companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. GuaranteedIrish.ie. Altogether better. Home sweet home. Maybe it's in the middle of town or the middle of nowhere or maybe you haven't found your home just yet. That's why our Bank of Ireland mortgage specialists cover the length and breadth of Ireland to meet you at a time that suits you best. Meet us in branch, in a coffee shop or even in the little slice of country you call home to chat about your personal mortgage plans. Anywhere, anytime. Bank of Ireland. Begin. Lenin criteria and terms and conditions apply. Security and insurance required. Over 18s only. Bank of Ireland Mortgage Bank trading as Bank of Ireland Mortgages is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Uf, tenerte como socio sería fantástico para nuestro equipo. Tim has now been video calling on his mobile with his potential new business partners in Madrid for 45 minutes and 36, no, 37 seconds. Luckily, time on his phone isn't a concern for Tim. With Three's 20 euro SIM only business plan, he gets all calls, all texts and all you can eat data so he can just keep nodding while he Google translates what on earth they're saying. Switch today at your local 3 store or visit 3.ie forward slash business. 3. Make it count. 20 euro a month for the first six months, 30 euro a month thereafter. 30 day minimum term. Fair usage allowance applies to data used in the EU. See 3.ie.
This is Peter Fergus. He's got the right kind of energy for business. I'm hotel manager of the lodge at Ashford Castle here in County Mayo. It's a demanding role, but I love it. Peter knows what it takes to make the business a success. We aim to deliver a premium experience for our guests with minimal impact on the environment. And he has a vision for the future. Our business is powered by 100% green electricity supplied by SSE Airtricity, so our guests can sleep even sounder. Switch to the right kind of energy for business today at sseairtricity.com. SSE Airtricity. This is Generation Green. Hey, big ears. What? Have you heard? What? Ford are offering 20 euro off a spring service. Yo, what? That's right. 20 euro off when you book online using code FORD20. Problem is... What? We're rabbits. Book now at Ford.ie or search Ford Service. Retail customers at participating Ford dealers cannot be used with other Ford service promotions. Only one voucher per customer per booking. A man in his 20s is in a critical condition after he was shot in West Dublin this evening. Brand new, The Guards Inside the K starts tonight at 9 on Virgin Media 1. From breaking down doors to the aftermath of gangland shootings, this groundbreaking new series gives unprecedented access to Gardaí on the front line. They have no respect for us, no respect for life. Brand new, The Guards Inside the K starts tonight at 9 on Virgin Media 1. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. OK, welcome back. Full times in the FA Cup. Leicester through to the next round. They've beaten Birmingham City by a goal to nil. Manchester City also through, courtesy of a Sergio Aguero goal away to Sheffield Wednesday. Extra time ensuing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Spurs won, Norwich won is the uh, full time after 90 minutes there. Meanwhile, in uh, Scotland, Celtic have a 13-point lead now at the top of the table. They drew two all away to Livingston, but a bad night for Rangers at home to Hamilton and Stephen Gerrard. They lost by a goal to nil. Elsewhere, Kilmarnock and Aberdeen drew two all. Motherwell beat Ross County 4-1 and it was a nil-all draw between St Mirren and St Johnston. Now, back to our chat with Dan McDonald. So uh, I wanted to play him uh, something from uh, Steve Bruce today in his press conference. He was not a happy camper. Uh, Craig Hope in the mail, as you'll hear in a moment, asked a question, and Steve Bruce didn't want to answer that because there were reports the previous day that Alan St Maximin was uh, dropped. He wasn't injured. Injured was the word that uh, Newcastle gave, but the Mail felt he'd been dropped for the draw with Burnley at the weekend, that there had been some kind of bust-up or row between Steve Bruce and Maximin. And when Craig Hope of the Mail asked a question, Bruce, not a happy man. I'm not going to answer you, Craig. No? You just outed this trail is totally. No? It's total lies. It's nonsense. I'm glad your source is wrong. I'm t are you calling me a liar? So what are you calling me? Are you calling me a liar? Well, your report was wrong. Why can't you just it? Well, there you are, then you are. I've had no row with Almer, uh, with St. Maxim, OK? None. Did the player a bust-up. Did, did the player think he was fit to start on Saturday? I didn't ask that. You you wrote that I had a bust-up. No, no, you, you wrote yesterday that I had a bust-up. Bust yes, you did. I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. The word bust-up okay. wasn't used. I didn't use the word row, I didn't. Well, we've had a bust-up. That was the headline? Yeah. OK, then we'll beg can to you, differ. Craig it's always up, Newcastle, isn't it? Is that, is Joe Kinnear had the one there, didn't he? When he went, he sort of went in, sort of, uh, yeah. you know, Michael Douglas and falling down, except just with words. The audio doesn't quite do Steve Bruce's anger justice. Very angry, really eyeballing Craig. Hope, really not happy with this. Wanted to shoot it down. I went to see what was in the article. This was the fascinating thing, and you heard Craig there say, he didn't use the word route, never wrote the word bust up. Yeah. Steve Bruce said it was in the headline. Craig says not in the headline. So do you have it? I do. Give us those words. Newcastle star Alan St. Maximin's future in doubt after fallout with Steve Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think Craig knew the word was fallout. It's also in his piece as well, fallout. So, uh, but he had him, look, he had him. He what, had him in a way, technically. What's but, the difference between, if, uh, see, a bust up to me sounds more aggressive. Well, it sounds like it got physical almost. A yeah, bust up is more aggressive, whereas a fallout is like, I mean, we could fall out. You know, we could be, could be a bit odd with each other, yeah. you know. Like things, things have, have changed, but you may not necessarily have had a confrontation. Well, I suspect Steve Bruce walked out of that press conference and said, get, get me that bloody article, bring it over here, <laughs> fall out. Ah, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Craig is in the car, booting it out of the training <laughs> range. <laughs> Craig used to work in Newcastle, actually, back yeah. in the day, in the club. But, uh, I mean, he, he, 
to be fair, he's, he's, uh, he's a very good recent track record of stories from within the club. Well, he so. was standing over his story for sure and he was saying, did Maximin think he was fit to play? That was obviously the, key the point. issue, yeah. But anyway, look, it's much ado about nothing. But we, that was the, one of the more exciting press conferences uh, today. Meanwhile, uh, Jurgen Klopp, did you watch much of the game last night? I did. Well, uh, do you know, I was, I, was I was listening to you guys while uh, watching the, the game. So a uh, bit of both, yeah. I mean, they're in quite the losing streak now by Liverpool standards. Oh, listen, since that kid wrote the letter to them, that's the whole. <laughs> that seems to be the, the turning point of the season. Uh, so Jurgen Klopp uh, talking after their loss last night. Not worried, he said, about his side's performance, but did acknowledge that their recent defensive displays are the issue. Have a listen. Usually you don't get a lot of chance against our stuff like this. Now we have to admit that in the last three games, we four? I'm not sure what was first, Norwich or Atletico, but if then we, we conceded absolutely too many goals, that's true. From completely different situations, so it's not one problem, but we see that as well. But I'm not worried about the momentum. The momentum is not something you don't get as a present. You have to get it to keep it. No, I'm not concerned about the momentum. I'm, um, but it's it's football. We never thought it will be easy. It will be easy season. It will be an easy period. It will be an easy game tonight. Nothing. It was always good. It will be difficult. It was always difficult. The performance tonight was completely different to the performance of Watford against Watford. Was really bad tonight. It was not bad tonight. It was a, was a really super intense game. We made seven changes. I said we knew that it will be intense. That by we made the, that's why we made the changes. It was clear. A lot of sprints. A lot of spaces in midfield, how Chelsea plays, how we wanted to play, it was clear you need accelerations constantly, they, they offer that constantly, it was, that's why we had to make the changes, and, um, or we thought we have to make it. That performance tonight, um, I'm not concerned about, that's football, if you make decisive mistakes, then you lose football games. I think ultimately there's a lot of truth in his analysis of the situation, and it was a different performance to the one we saw against Watford. Seven changes as well, it was an end-to-end -end game, they're away from home, it's not easy. Yet, it is very striking. You, you, you break the seal sometimes, you lose momentum, and it can be hard to pick things back up. And there were undoubtedly numerous games in the previous 44 where they could have easily lost and yet found a way not to. Mm. So you're not worried for them long-term, medium-term, short-term, and yet the Atletico game in particular is hovering. They could do with feeling a bit well, better about life. Well, let's say they lose that game, or, or let's say they, they don't get through. Uh, and they go out so they're now out of the club. Eminently possible if it does well, score. I mean, like, yeah. the position they're in, like, it wouldn't be a... I don't think it'd be a, sh a massive shock. It would be a shock in the context of the tie, but, like, where they're at, like, it's, it's, it's very plausible to see a scenario where, where they don't go through. Yeah. Uh, so, what, like, do you end up sort of in a weird way that this is the 30-year thing they've wanted to end, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be a massive outpouring when it does happen. Mm. But does the, the, the latter third or whatever, latter part of the season end up feeling a small bit hollow? that they're just sort of on this long, long victory lap. Yeah. And I do think there is something in it that you have this incredible momentum, and like the manager's not going to go out and say, yes, we've lost our momentum, but they've been striving for something. And even early in the season, there was games where you, like, their record now stands apart as like a, an extraordinary record, but they didn't play well in every game. No. There was a lot of matches where they pulled it out of the fire, and then we would use language as though, well, they know how to win. You know, they've learned, they've learned from the past, and... and in that game yesterday, uh, last night, like they actually had moments where earlier in the season they probably would have pulled it out of it, and they, they didn't. And um, I don't know, like, they, you know, they've achieved their goal, their primary goal for the season, very early. They've basically done it by Christmas, mm. really, mm. By, you know, by early January. And I just think it's hard to maintain that. And I think if you start to lose it a small bit, I think it can be difficult to just pull it back. Yeah. Um, I, it's... A, it's a minor concern. I think the, but the Madrid game, the Atletico game, is, is very valid to build it up as a big deal now because I think you know, the, the mood around the end of their season, yes, when they win it, but like you're, you're a pretty awkward April, May with the League One, yeah. you know, have and it done by the end of March. To not to play for. I think it'd be a small bit hollow. Like not in, like in, in, in a year's time, that won't matter, mm. but just in the here and now. No, I agree. It's a small bit flat. Especially if they're watching Manchester City progress and really playing for the Champions League as, as, as uh, the season culminates. And as well as that, this side now, even though they still haven't won the league technically, this side now uh, seem to have graduated into a conversation uh, about overall greatness. They're standing in comparison to the great teams. And teams do have a shelf life. There is an argument that Liverpool and the Champions League this year, it is as good a chance as Liverpool will have to win the Champions League 
when you look at the strength of Liverpool and all the other main contenders. Mm. It's as good a chance as they will have to win the Champions League this season as they might have for another 20 years. You think? It's, it's entirely 20 years? I mean, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see where you're coming from. Two yeah. or three months ago, I ha I, around Christmas time, when they were at their peak, to my eye, across this season, around Christmas, when they were just phenomenal and a joy to watch, I remember thinking, if they don't win the Champions League as well as the league, and the league even then was already done, underachievement's a strong word, but they're certainly the best team in Europe at the moment, and they were playing like it. And so, you, you, it, when you look at the powerhouses of European football, Barcelona are at a low ebb, Real Madrid are at a low ebb, Bayern Munich were very good, obviously, yeah. the other night, but they're not the Bayern Munich of two, three, four, five years ago, and certainly not the Bayern Munich that were there under Guardiola. Uh, Manchester City in a state of, uh, disarray is a strong word, but not, not the Manchester City of the previous couple of seasons. No. And so you list, you know, PSG always, always beatable because of where they're coming from. So if you list off the top five, six, I mean, jump in if I'm, if I'm forgetting one, Juventus are always there as well. But if you list off the top teams in Europe, a lot of them at a low ebb in comparison to where they may be over the next decade or no, so. No, I get it. And so and so in, yeah. that, in that sense, will it be hollow? No, because they're going to win the league. And that, that lap of honour when they're carrying the Premier League trophy around Anfield is going to be stupendous yeah. and will live long in the memory. But, I, but I'm just saying, when you're now talking about this side in terms of what's their overall standing, compare them to previous Liverpool sides, how many European Cups did they win versus the current crop, this was is a big opportunity for this team if they can get their form back. No, it is. they're the best team in Europe. Yeah, no, I, I suppose the best team in Europe, I mean, they, they have the trophy at the moment. Um, but they still are this season. They still are the best team in Europe this season up until about... Three weeks no, they, they probably are, yeah. Although the results, in the, ironically enough, the results in the Champions League in the autumn weren't actually that good. Yeah. The European performances across the year haven't been exceptional yeah. by any means, you know. So they haven't, but they haven't reached the level in my mind that you would have had, like with Barcelona previously, you know, when they were in their pomp. Although Barcelona probably didn't win as many Champions League as they as they maybe should have, yeah. you know. And this is the thing; it's still a cup competition. For all you talk about it, best team in Europe doesn't always win it. Like, and that's and and. Unless you're miles ahead, unless you're actually streets ahead, then you can be caught. Mm. And this is the this is the point. Like they could be caught by Atletico Madrid, which would make you think that really, yeah, they were probably you know probably are or were the best team in Europe. Not are the best team in Europe. I think it's fair enough in terms yeah, of the performance across are. the year. But but not in such a way that the golf is so substantial that it's you know it's a, it's a given that they should be winning it. No, you know, I, like, I, like sure. I, I could see. I mean, I mean, PSG can go out. Like this is the thing. Like you know, or Bayern. But you, like if Liverpool were to end up playing Bayern, for example, it wouldn't be a massive shock if they if they were knocked out by them. But the Liverpool were still like, you know, Liverpool were, were turned over by Barcelona last year, but then produced an incredible performance. Like some of their away performances in Europe in the last two years actually haven't been very good at all mm. in terms of you know marking yourself out as like this outstanding side of a yeah. of a generation. So. It's, it's not a massive shock to me that they might be caught out by it. Not a massive shock, but a source of... Oh, it'll, it'll, it'll niggle away at them if they're... If they, like, depending on who... I mean, we're, we're, getting, we're jumping along down the line. They may end up winning the trophy themselves. But I know what you're saying. If they see someone else lifting the trophy, there will probably be a sense of... We could beat them. We could do them, yeah. Uh, by the way, just Billy Gilmore very good last night. Excellent, yeah. 18 years old, played in the middle of Scottish. a trade. Scottish, technical... Small, but still could cover the ground. Really impressive. Great passer of the ball. And David Snade had a great idea on the 42 because Billy Gilmore made his Chelsea senior debut in a pre-season uh, friendly. Uh, they played bows and pats Chelsea. Yeah. People remember Frank Lampard and co turning up in Dublin. So he has some great quotes. Lee Desmond was there for uh, pats. And he says, I swear to God, I'm not just saying it because of the game against Liverpool. I remember after the game, we played Chelsea. All the lads in the dressing room were saying the same thing. Effing hell. Who the hell is that kid for them midfield? Yeah. Uh, he's, and then... Uh, so, I well mean, believe that. Desmond's a really good pro as well. Yeah. One of the, like, well, they knew. I mean, they could see. Do you know the other interesting insight? And I could retire for time. Sorry to rush. But um, you know the way we hear that it, it, it's good to talk on the pitch? Mm. So imagine playing Chelsea. You're going to be interested. Do they talk much? Do they say What are, what are they saying to each other in the field? Desmond says... I couldn't believe how quiet they all were. Now, I know it's only a pre-season for them, but I was looking at Louise, Tamori. They didn't say a word. And it was strange. You're always told from a young lad to talk, 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 even if some of it is bollocks, he says. But barely a word 
uh, was said, and Gilmore was the same. Now, he didn't need to really. He was everywhere, getting the ball, always knew what to do with the ball. He looks like a special player. But there you go. Chelsea, either a silent team generally or just for pre-season friendlies. Yeah. It's interesting with Gilmore, though. I know we're tight on time. But yeah. remember, like, we, we, we were wowing, um, we were wowed by Ampadu. When he was ah, outstanding yeah. he's against Wales, here, right? yeah, sad but, he's, but he's like he's he's on the books of Chelsea as well. He's on loan. Like it's it's a uh, that Chelsea academy for years always had great players. But I, I sometimes wonder as well that they didn't always get the chance. And you have to give these players a chance. And I think there's a lot of talented young lads have been through Chelsea, who would have relished the opportunity to play at 17, 18 when they were full of confidence but you know, a lot of them I think they were battered and bruised yeah. by the time it came around. And uh, sometimes you just got to give them a chance. Dan McDonald there of the Irish Independent speaking to us a short time ago. So we're pretty much done for the evening. They're into extra time in front of me here at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Jose Mourinho observing things. Troy Parrott is on the pitch. Don't lose your minds. Troy Parrott is getting game time for Spurs. And he'll get uh, another 15 minutes of extra time as well. So we'll see if he can rustle something up. Spurs won. Norwich won. Adam Ida also playing for Norwich. Leicester through this evening. Manchester City through and a loss for Rangers away to Hamilton, a draw for Celtic 2-2 in their game. So they are 13 points clear in Scotland. OTB AM coming at you tomorrow, usual places, half past seven, all our social channels, or download the Go Loud app and you'll be able to listen to OTB Sports Radio. And then tomorrow evening here on the wireless, Nathan back in the hot seat, John Giles, uh, Rachel Blackmore, and some of tonight's roadshow at the Camden. Tom Dunn is on the way next. Good luck.